We really take for granted today just how cheap data storage is. The ability to run a backup is honestly under $50. This is a 16 gigabyte USB stick, USB 3 even. This is a fast little device. We can run our backups onto that, no problem. We can also image to hard disks if we want because they're not that expensive now either. But what we take for granted now in the 1980s and even into the 1990s was a lot more expensive. Flash memory did not yet exist. Hard drives, well, they really weren't that much cheaper. I mean, you had a 200 megabyte hard drive. If you wanted to buy a second 200 megabyte hard drive to back up the whole system, well, that was gonna cost you 700, several hundred dollars. 700 dollars, sure. But that was still a very fragile disk, and if they were both in the same machine, it's entirely possible, or even just close by to each other, whatever physical damage might have damaged one disk may damage the other one as well. Thankfully, there were backup solutions that were practical, but not that much cheaper. One such example is Bernoulli. This is a 65 megabyte cartridge. It comes in a fairly rigid, fairly durable plastic enclosure. It has a safety lid. It looks kind of like a floppy disk. It didn't sell all that well, however, because it was considerably expensive. Now, of course, there was also super cheap methods that you could also implement. And MS-DOS, for example, came with a backup program which lets you back up your system to floppy disk. The problem is with that, when you have a 200 megabyte hard drive, backing up 200 megabytes of data can require a fair number of floppy disks. This becomes quite bulky and frankly, quite impractical. <sighs> Thankfully, by this point here, there was already a medium that had been used for computers for decades already, which had proven to be both reliable and cheap. Tape. The origins of tape on computers goes back a long way, but nine track tape is one such example of just how durable tape can be made to be. And in this case here, it was just a simple magnetic formulation onto a Mylar backing, and it could be used in a variety of formats and tape drives, and it was the de facto standard for decades. And even today, you can still read back in many cases the data that's on these tapes. And it was very cost efficient even then, as opposed to using direct access or random access storage devices such as hard drives. But these are big. So that's where QIC, or the quarter inch cartridge format, came to be. This started to show up around the late 1970s, and by the 1980s, we had managed to make this even smaller. This is the miniature version of QIC. And if I take it out of its packaging here, as you can see, it's significantly smaller in every way and manner. This was way more practical to use in a PC. These, when you first saw them on the market, were usually full height tape drives. Eventually they went down to half height tape drives, but these were always available in a half height tape drive format. And there were a number of products that were available on the market at that time, and straight into the 90s with compatibility into the 2000s. Complete packages were available from a variety of vendors. We had Everex, we had Wangtech, we had Irwin, but I'm quite loyal myself to a company called Colorado Memory Systems. They produced this little gem right here. This is the Jumbo 250. It is a 250 megabyte maximum capacity floppy tape drive. This was both simple, small, and very cheap to implement. Instead of requiring a SCSI card or a proprietary tape controller, this plugged into your floppy controller, just right through the same ribbon cable that your floppy drives were plugged into. You did have to sacrifice one of your two floppy drives to make it work, and it was significantly slower because now you had your floppy controller playing the role as a tape controller. Well, it didn't matter. It was cheap. It worked really well. But if you really did need the performance, there were products that were available. Colorado released this thing here called the FC20. This here still has a floppy controller on it. In fact, it has the Intel S82078, fairly standard single chip, chip floppy controller. And then Colorado has their own dedicated chipset down here, which is the tape interface, and is probably also handling uh, hardware compression. These tape drive controllers also have an external connector on the back of them, which quite simply just route the internal 34 pin header and also DC power, which is brought into the card using the Molex plug on the top here. And the kits 
even came with their own software packages, drivers even. So this is one floppy disk and this is the entire toolkit. It's fairly simple and it works really well. And the easiest way to show just how well it works is that we're going to install this into a machine. And I've gone here and I've uh, set up a 486 machine and I'm gonna install it into the system here. And it's, again, it's very easy, I'll show you that. And then we'll bring up the software and I'll even run a backup for you. Let's get into this. Now, as I open this machine up here, I'm going to admit a little bit that I've cheated. I had to actually go and test to make sure, even though I've owned this entire setup here for 20 years now, when I got at a garage sale, and it worked fantastic even back then, QIC has a major drawback compared to those more simplistic tape formats, such as 9-Track, and that they have more moving parts inside of them. The drives are known to have a problem where the roller inside, which interfaces with the cartridge, can degrade and turn into a rubber nasty mess, which will both make the drive not work, but also contaminate and potentially ruin any tapes that you put into it. The tapes themselves aren't a whole hell of a lot better. I have a tome here, it's for my HP 9845, and at this point here it's so moldy and nasty I can't really use it. And it too contains some very early examples of this QIC tape format, this right here. And the problem with these is that it's not that the roller in here has gone bad, that's hard plastic, but the rubber band that has gone around inside of the tape, which is used to move everything around, it hasn't stretched, some of them will stretch, but it's in fact bonded with the tape inside. So when I move this roller right here, it'll actually peel the oxide right off of the mylar backing the tape is stored on. As a result, the data on this tape is then rendered unreadable. Worse yet, now you have a giant clear spot on your tape, so the end of tape markers no longer line up with where they are. So I was kind of surprised really to find that after 20 years of this of being in storage, not even 20 years, 15 years of being in storage, I put the drive in, I put the tapes in, and everything worked all right. So this one here, when we open it up, you're already going to see I have a 34-pin ribbon cable that's already routed through the machine. That's just because I, I'm going to save us a bit of time here with cable routing. Other than that, because on this machine I have a 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive and a 3 and a half, we can't use the typical floppy controller in here to run the tape drive. So we are required to use the FC20. It's worth pointing out, this thing has no jumpers on it. There's no settings on here. In fact, really the only thing we have on here is the silk screening, which points out that we can use this in an exclusively 8-bit slot or a 16-bit ISA slot. If we use the 8-bit slot, we're limited to a max data throughput of 1 megabit per second, or 128 kilobytes a second. But if we use the full 16-bit slot here, we can have data rates up to 2 megabits per second 256 kilobytes per second. It doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot, but that's pretty fast for tape in such a weird format such as this. And think about it, in 1993, how big were your files? That's more than enough to burst right a couple of files to tape at one go with compression. So what I'm gonna do here is pin one to pin one. I'm going to attach our ribbon cable. And then I'm going to drop that into the slot right here. And then I'm going to take a single screw. And I'm going to drop that in there to hold it in place. Now, at any point here, I haven't tested it. You may be able to add an additional tape drive through the back port on the here. I don't have the documentation. And for the most part, if you're just doing one drive and one card, you really don't need any additional documentation. It's almost plug and play. For the tape drive on the front here, I've already made these little fancy drive rails. They're made out of wood because at this point here, many of these computer cases which have these fancy drive rails have lost their drive rails. But I could just slide that in, at least once I take out the set screw. And then you fight with the ribbon cable because genius you, you put your floppy drive on top and I can't see the ribbon cable plugging in underneath. You know what, I'll make this easier for myself. I'm just gonna take that drive out. Okay, now we can install the tape drive. So that's gonna go into my middle slot here. 
and that'll just slide in. And I can see through the windows here. I can just plug in my tape drive there, plug in my power there, and then I can apply my set screws. And there we go, everything is plugged back in again. And then we can take our cover here. Without any jumpers, the drive's installed. And it's really, it's quite elegant if you look at it. I mean, you just have the one bezel here. It's not intrusive. It's not some off color from the beige white that everybody was using at that time. And really all you now have to do is grab yourself your tape, stuff that into the drive, and then you can go and you can take your software and we'll install that. This is a fairly standard and modest MS-DOS machine from the early 1990s. The base system here we have is a 46 DX2 running at 66 megahertz, and it has a turbo button, which interestingly, if I hit the turbo button, it only goes to 56. So we're just gonna leave it for the sake of this video at 33 megahertz. Uh, internally, nothing really special about that. We have the tape controller, we have VLB graphics. We really don't have any other expansion besides serial and parallel. We have our VGA monitor, and this is kind of grubby because this system isn't actually mine. The quirk about this system is it's being installed in a location where reliability and longevity is required. Yes, this video is from 2021. As a result, instead of putting a mechanical hard drive in there, I've put in a disc on a module, one of these little buddies right here. I really love these things simply because they, it's 256 megabytes, so it's underneath most major BIOS limitations. They are auto-detected and do CHS translation with all standard BIOSes, so you don't require DDOs or special software to get them running. And they're small, and they're a flash-based device, so they run completely silent and use pretty much no power. Anyways, so we will be taking our software here, and I will insert that into our drive. And you can see down here, the system has already gone up and booted. So normally I would go to the floppy drive. And there we go. We have our install exe right there. Now I've already gone and actually installed this into the system to save us a couple of minutes here. So if I go to C and I go to uh, we have the program already installed. When you run the installer, you're going to run into the config program. So we're going to run that now. And that'll come up here, Colorado Backup version 4. And we were doing a hardware configuration. And it's going to ask us right here, are we running one of these cards? Well, there's the FC20. So I'm going to say yes. And it'll run through that there. And it'll auto configure it because it's really that nice. Remember, this is a jumperless card. Yes. We'll have it auto configure. It'll test a base IO address where it's looking for that. I'm not going to install the scheduler. We don't have EMS installed. Now it's asking for a base booting drive. So we're going to say C and that's fine. So this is interesting. It's using DMA channel two interrupt six or IRQ six. IRQ6 is almost entirely dedicated to the floppy controller. And I guess it kind of makes sense here because it has its own onboard floppy controller. I, that's a very efficient way of installing this controller onto the system since you're not going to be using your main floppy controller when you're performing a backup. In fact, you're not going to be doing a whole heck of a lot of anything. It's just going to use those resources by default and it saves you having to lose a different DMA channel or an IRQ just to have the controller in there. But we're good. And there we go, the configuration is successful. So I will get out of there and it wants me to now run the tape program. Before we do that, I'm going to grab our tape. I'm just going to insert it into the drive. Simple as that. And that's gonna take a moment here to spool up.
There we go. Now that it's ready, I'm just going to pop the floppy disk out of here because we don't need that anymore. And we'll run the tape program. So, interestingly, remember how I've said I've used this drive here and I've used the tapes here before many years ago? As it turns out, um, Microsoft or Windows Backup, when I used it with this drive, is not compatible with Colorado's own software. So I actually had to format the tape in order to use this. And that was Alt-U, and you can just kind of format the tape. Now, a warning about this, this is a very time-consuming process. It has to go over the entire tape and then wipe it end to end. And there's multiple tracks on there vertically, so it's gonna be quite a while. It was about an hour and 45 minutes. I'm gonna save you, I've already formatted this tape. Technically, it's actually a good thing to format the tape because it'll, re it'll retention it after all these years, but it'll also guarantee to you that the tape's not going to die horrifically when you demonstrate it, like I'm doing right now. So we don't have to do any of that. We don't have to retention. We're not even gonna have to rename the tape. So you have a bunch of setups in here. If you wanna know more about this, again, version 4.5, there's copyrights here from Colorado and there's from HP. And I'm sure we've all seen at least one HP with this. But we are going to perform a backup. Very simple software interface here. So we can do backup, we can restore, we can compare data on the drive to a tape, but we're just gonna run the backup here. We're going to run a total backup. If we do selective, we can select which files on the drive we wanna back up. If we want to modify file, or check for modify, multi, uh, blah. If we wanna check for files that have been modified, again, we can do it here by comparing. We're just gonna do a total backup. Where does it want me to start? It wants me to start here at C, and that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna do the whole drive. Um, in reality, 256 megabytes solid state disk, and there's only about mm, 40 megabytes of data on here. So it's not gonna take too long, but the tape accelerator that we've put in there is gonna speed things up a fair bit. And I'm going to hit okay, okay, okay. And it's going to just calculate to make sure that we have enough space here. There we go. And we're gonna add a volume title to this. So we're gonna do, it says backup. Um, we're going to, can we actually do that? There we go. So I can scroll down here. I can now set if I wanna have what kind of compression. Are we optimizing for time or are we optimizing for space? Well, let's optimize for space because then that'll use the hardware compression that's built into the accelerator card. Do we want an error log file? Sure, we'll add that in there. Can we password protect the tape? Yeah, we can do that as well, but I'm not going to do that. And now let's back up. So the tape's already in there. We've told it what to do. We haven't scheduled it and off it goes. Now it's waiting for the drive here. It's gonna query it and it's going to start off on this here. And there it goes. And off it goes. Now it's saying here that we currently have a compression ratio of one to one. That is more than likely going to increase as we travel through different files. But it's also saying here that we have four minutes and 55 seconds to back up. So I find that completely, that's very optimistic. My guess here is it's going to take around 45 minutes to do about 45 megabytes of data. So we're gonna leave this alone here for a little bit and it's just gonna go away and it's just gonna write through all these files to the tape. As you can see, we still have 38 megs left, but we've already done 1.2 megs. So we've already written the equivalent of one five and a quarter inch floppy disk. And it's getting even better all the time. We're already at 5%. This is actually way faster. Anyways, we're gonna cut here and we'll come back just as the backup process completes.
Oh, it's done. All right, so I call that a total lie on that, um, where was I? I'm not awake yet. There we go. Remember how I said this thing was only gonna take like four minutes to complete? Yeah, it sure as hell did not. Take a look at that counter there in the corner. 17 minutes and 13 seconds to complete the operation, not four minutes. Total tape used was 23 megabytes. And by the looks of it, we achieved a maximum compression of 1.6 to one. That's not bad at all. What you did not, however, see when I was making this video is that this is no longer this tape. This tape actually died on me about 60% through and I had to start this over again. And a little bit of an update to what I just said right there. So I thought to myself, well, maybe this was just a one-off failure. So I went back and quickly erased the tape and tried again, and sure enough, here it is, operation successful. So yeah, that was just a one-off error that I just tried again, and uh, it worked fine. So, we're done, here we go. We have now completed that, and we can X out of that, and let's go to Alt View, uh, check our tape status, we'll see what it's like. Has it actually saved it onto there? Yeah, and there it is. So it sees that there's 190 megabytes compressed that are available. We've used just 23 megs. Yeah, there we go. And our last format was May 3rd, 1994. To be, to be honest here, that's actually because I have the system here set to 1994. That's a Y2K problem. We're not going to deal with that. But there we go. We have now done a backup, and we are now able to, I bet you verify the data is still on there. So we'll view the tape directory. And there we go. Yeah, sure, let's view that. There we go. And there's all of our files backed up onto this tape here. Not bad, I must say. That's a very convenient way in the price of like, what, $300 for the tape drive, the controller, and the software, and maybe even an extra free tape, you have a very powerful and very useful tape backup solution for your home computer. And that's how we did it. If we didn't want to deal with other weird disk formats or just writing everything out to floppy disks, and I know a few of us have done that, but tape drive really was a practical way to go. And even today, tape drives are still in use. Many of us will think it's an obsolete technology, but it consumes no power when it's not in use, and it has high longevity. It'll last years, even decades in proper storage. And that's for large institutions, very desirable because it then makes it very cheap. Well, that was the video here we had on tape backup systems and specifically this product offering that was available from Colorado. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed seeing that the backup system on this really works because honestly, I am impressed. It does still all work just as well as it did when I used it, when I took it out of service 15 years ago. And now this machine here is going to be going out with this tape drive. I wish the best for this system and its uh, return to use. I wish I could tell you what it was going into, but I'm not allowed to. And I hope for all of you, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. And until next time, have a good one. <laughs>